Each summer, professional baseball and football hold their Hall of Fame induction ceremonies. Last Sunday, Mike Piazza and Ken Griffey Jr. were inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. Ken Griffey Jr. was the number one overall pick in 1987, and he had tremendous expectations thrust upon him when he was still a teenager. And he's, in fact, the first number one overall pick to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Piazza, on the other hand, was selected with the 1,390th pick in the, six, the 62nd round. They don't even have 62 rounds in the draft anymore in 1988. He's the lowest draft pick ever to be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. So the highest and the lowest went in same day, last Sunday. Piazza was chosen by the Dodgers only as a family favor because of his family's relationship with Tommy Lasorda, the Dodgers manager at the time. He even quit playing baseball after he was drafted, not once, but twice but then resumed his training and his career, and he became one of the best offensive catchers of all time. This coming Saturday, the NFL will enshrine its latest group in the Football Hall of Fame, but I don't feel as kindly about the NFL, NFL so they're not getting more details. <laughs> Being voted into a Hall of Fame means that you're a part of an elite group of professional athletes whose physical abilities skill, and disciplined training enabled you to accomplish incredible feats of strength, speed, and coordination that made you wor worthy to receive the highest honor in your sport. And yet, to see Hall of Fame athletes in their highlight films at the peak of their playing days and then to see what they look like as the years go by we're reminded of how fleeting life really is and how our bodies, even the very, very best of them, age and change and nothing can stop the process. For most of us, old is someone who's at least 10 years older than we are, whatever that is a moving target. Well, physical fitness, we know, is something that we all should pay attention to. God created us with physical bodies that need proper nutrition, rest, exercise, and care. And it turns out that being out of shape can be more harmful to our health and our longevity than we realized. A study that was published just this week in the European Journal of Preventative Cardiology, oh, the stuff I read now, found that poor physical fitness may be second only to smoking as a risk factor for premature death. Poor fitness, it turns out, is unhealthier even than high blood pressure and high cholesterol. So we can keep eating lobster, which is good. But physical training and being in shape we all know it can definitely help us live longer and better lives, and being unfit, well, it's not good. Well, the Bible says that as important as physical training is, there's another kind of training that's even more important, even more vital to our well-being. And we hear it in 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in the middle of verse 7, where it says simply, train yourselves in godliness. For while physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise both for the present life and the life to come. In the spirit of the Olympics, the flags on the wall behind me represent the countries of origin for people in our congregation. Did you realize our congregation was this diverse? I think it's really cool. And if you don't see the flag of your nation of origin, let us know and we will add it. Uh, up there we have flags from France, Brazil, Germany, Poland, Jamaica, the United States, Sweden, Holland, Uganda, Peru, India, Colombia, Canada, and China. 
pretty impressive. And we even have people from New Jersey. So it's like all over, all over the place. Well, this Friday, the Summer Olympic Games open in Rio, as we all know, and they're going to be running through, for a number of weeks, through August 21st, and tens of millions of people, this always really gets me, tens of millions of people are going to turn, all over the world, are going to tune in to watch athletes they've mostly never heard of before in their lives compete in a host of different events. And these athletes have spent years and years in disciplined training involving great sacrifice, hardship, focus, all for the chance to perform, in some cases, for less than a minute. Think about that. You imagine devoting yourself, where you live, what you eat, everything you do, 24 hours a day, all for something that might take less than 60 seconds. I just think it's amazing how much people give up and how hard people train for the chance at a medal and greatness in one's field, however fleeting that may be. Physical training is of some value. It helps us get the most out of our body. It increases our strength, our flexibility, our endurance. It helps us fight off illness and disease. It helps us recover faster from injuries and the endorphins produced by exercise benefit our attitude and our sense of self-confidence, as Elle Woods tells us in Legally Blonde. <laughs> Happy people don't shoot their husbands. They just don't. When we're engaged in regular physical training, whether we're walking, whether we're running, I'm sorry, I'm really punchy this morning, you just have to deal with it. Whether we're walking, whether we're running, whether we're swimming, whether we're biking, whether we're lifting, whether we're doing yoga, whether we're playing a sport, whatever it is, it often makes us feel better, doesn't it? It makes us, often makes us feel better about ourselves, although sometimes it makes us feel worse, both physically or because we can't do what we used to do, and that's frustrating. And what happens when we haven't been doing physical training on a regular basis? What do you experience? When you start up again, are you at the same place you were when you left off? No. If we don't, what happens? You use it or you? So we know this is true. We know this is true of physical training. You use it or you lose it. And the good news is, though, any time we're willing to start up again with any kind of physical training, if we have a plan and we stick to it, we will see improvement, right? You'll see progress over time. Physical training is of some value. A woman was in an airport waiting for a flight with her family, and they were sitting there at gate 35, and this is how she described what happened. She said, then I heard a voice on the public address system saying, we apologize for the inconvenience, but Delta Flight 570 will now be boarding from gate 41. So she said she and her family schlepped up all their luggage and everything and went traipsing across the terminal to go to the new gate. And 10 minutes later, once they were there, another announcement over the PA system. Uh, Flight 570, in fact, is going to be boarding from gate 35. So everybody, they all picked up all their luggage. They schlepped all the way back to the original gate. And just as they were settling down again, the voice came over the PA system a third time. And they all kind of like braced themselves and said, thank you for participating in Delta's physical training program. <laughs> well, physical training is of some value. But the Bible says it's even more important to train ourselves in godliness. Because godliness is valuable in every way. It touches every aspect of our life. And it touches not only this life, but the life to come. The Greek word translated as train in 1 Timothy 4 is gymnazo. It literally means exercise. It's the root from which we get the word gymnasium. How about that? And it's also used in several other places in the New Testament 
where we're told repeatedly human beings can be trained in a variety of areas and in a variety of ways, so it's wise to pick how we're going to train. In 2 Peter chapter 2, which is also like 1 Timothy 4, in part a warning about the influence of false teachers, it says they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin, they entice unsteady souls, they have hearts trained in greed. They have left the straight road and gone astray. In Hebrews chapter 5, the author laments the spiritual immaturity of people who should know better, but who haven't trained or exercised themselves in godliness. And it says in Hebrews 5.14, you need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk, still being unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose faculties have been trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. In Hebrews 12, verse 11, it says, Discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. All these scriptures are about the importance of spiritual training for godliness, to keep us on the straight road and away from sins like adultery and greed, to enable us to have the spiritual maturity to distinguish between good and evil. Training yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness and enables us to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly. Now this is kind of a key point. So... Listen right here, just for this point. That's a tribute to Charles Stanley, who we talked about last night. I've met more than a few Christians who really struggle to understand that being saved by grace does not exempt us from hard work, strenuous effort, self-discipline, and spiritual training in godliness. Grace is opposed to earning. We can't earn or merit God's favor. But grace is not opposed to the effort that's involved in being a disciple once God's grace has come into our heart and into our life. In fact, it's God's grace that opens the door and God's word shows us the way to train ourselves spiritually so we can grow in Christ's likeness, which is what we are called out to do. People train themselves to do all kinds of things, many of which have nothing to do with godliness, many of which aren't healthy or helpful. Earlier this month was the Nathan Hot Dog Eating Championship, not our Nathan's, but <laughs> the company. And the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Championship was once again won by American Joey Chestnut, who ate 70 hot dogs and buns in 10 minutes. While it takes training to accomplish such a feat, it hardly seems the best use of one's time or one's body. I can only imagine what one's cholesterol level goes to after eating 70 hot dogs in 10 minutes. Surely there are better ways we can train ourselves. Titus says, train yourself in godliness because godliness is valuable in every way, both in the present life and in the life to come. In the last week, I have communicated in conversation and in writing with folks who are dealing with physical crises, family and relational issues, disappointments, grief, loneliness, addiction, accidents, the challenges brought on by aging. In other words, it was pretty much a typical week for me. But all of these things that are represented in our congregation can be met better and dealt with more successfully when we are training ourselves in godliness. In the book, The Art of Aging, a doctor's prescription for well-being. Not that anybody in our church would be interested in this subject. 
Dr. Sherwin Newland makes the point that if we want to live well and age well, we must participate actively in our lives. And his prescription for aging includes four different kinds of exercise. He says we have to exercise, you have to exercise your mind. Keep your mind active by reading frequently the newspaper, the Bible, good works of literature, do crossword puzzles, visit museums, take a class. He says we have to exercise our body. You've got to work out at home, join a gym, walk, swim, run, dance, get yourself moving. Get your heart rate up, your waistline down. Third, he says we have to exercise our compassion. And this is critical. He says, as we grow older, one of the good things is we may become more compassionate. Share with others how much you care about them. Demonstrate that you're interested in what other people have to say. And the fourth thing he says is that you have to stay connected. And social networks like we develop by being active in church really contribute to the quality of our lives. And staying active keeps us connected to one another. We often don't realize how much we mean to other people. One of the realities of life is that our body weakens as we age. But our spirit, our spirit can and should grow stronger the longer we live and walk with Christ. One of the reasons why so many of us find it hard to do physical exercise is you know, well, it's a matter of time, it's a matter of choice, it's a matter of self-discipline, but some of us are simply limited by what our body can do at this point in our life. But the great thing about training ourselves in godliness is that, yeah, it takes time. It takes time to read the Bible, it takes time to pray, it takes time to serve. But unlike physical training where it's like, okay, I have to go run, Training in godliness is done simply while we are living our life. As we're interacting with our family, people we work with, people we encounter as we go about our day, while we're at the beach, while we're at the store, while we drive, wherever we are, life is the gym where we train in godliness. You get that? Life is the gym where we train ourselves in godliness. Daryl mentioned uh, last night at the concert that, uh, you know, no matter what you eat or how much you exercise or everything else, well, you're going to die anyway, so, you know, kind of, what do we do? Well, well that's, I'll leave doctors, Dr. Daryl's, you know, physical advice to you, but um, spiritually speaking, how should we take care of ourselves spiritually when the Bible teaches us we are never ceasing spiritual beings? with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. I mean, think about that. You can train your body as much as you want. You're not going to have this body forever. But the Bible says we are never ceasing spiritual beings. So how should we be training spiritually? Perhaps we can adopt an exercise program for holiness. We can be I sense a t-shirt opportunity here. I didn't think of this early enough in the week. You know, sometimes the inspiration comes to you later. But, you know, if we put a swoosh up on the screen, everyone would know, they'd say, Nike. You know, if I put an Under Armour logo, many of us could identify that it was Under Armour. And really, as Christians, what we're doing is we are training for reigning. That's what we're doing. We're training for reigning. And if we want to do that, if we want to imitate Jesus, we can't live like our old selves. We need to live like Jesus did. The whole reason why athletes train, the reason why musicians and vocalists and instrumentalists practice is so you can perform without thinking about what you're doing. And we want to be able to live as Christians without thinking about, what am I supposed to do now? People who want to get in top physical shape often pay a personal trainer to guide, motivate, coach them along the way. Well, we have a personal trainer in godliness, and his name's Jesus. And he both shows us and tells us, here's what you got to do. 
All right? So from Jesus, your spiritual trainer, we see Jesus engage in spiritual exercises as we read the Gospels. And there are things we can do. So here's your exercise program for godliness. And I don't have them on the screen, so you're going to have to write them down. Number one thing. First begin by studying the manual. Studying the manual. The Patriots started training camp this week. Glory, hallelujah. And one of the things that every football player has to do, what do they have to study? The playbook. And if you don't learn the playbook, how long will you last with Bill Belichick's Patriots? We, if football players have to study the playbook, how much more important for us is it to study God's Word? So, exercise number one. You've got to start studying the Scripture to get the ideas, thoughts, and images of those Scriptures inside of me. So, 15 minutes a day. Get on it. I get to talk like Belichick the rest of the sermon. I don't have to be... <laughs> I don't have to be nice. I don't have to be polite or anything. Hey, he invoked Jesus this week during a press conference, too, so just not the most appropriate kind of way. But, I mean, really, football players are in meetings for hours. They study a playbook for hours. Can we take 15 minutes a day to look at God's Word? Number two, listen to the coach. Listen to the coach. And you know what spiritual practice that translates to? Silence. Silence. The practice of silence enables us to quiet the competing voices and noises so we can better listen to God's voice. So I want you to schedule. It's amazing that some of you are committing all this to memory without writing it down. That's, that's, <laughs> I want you to schedule one 15-minute period of silence this week. And get away from every screen in your house. Get outside. Spend 15 minutes in silence, and half of that you're going to spend just listening to the noise dampening down inside your own head. Study the manual. Read the Bible. Listen to the coach. Practice silence. At least one 15-minute period. Number three. For those of you who like to play tennis, improve your serve. Practicing service and obedience helps us learn, newsflash, we are not the center of the universe. This just in. Find a way to be a servant to at least one other person this week with absolutely no expectation they are going to do anything for you. And for those of you whose life consists of lots of lots of serving, in which it can sometimes, you know, we can get resentful, we can get a little... See each person you serve as a gift from God to help you grow in godliness. Number four, play under control. Play under control. And by this, I mean, how about trying the discipline of fasting? It's a tough thing to say when we have breakfast after worship. But Sundays are a feast day, not a fast day, so that's okay. But fasting teaches us we don't have to be controlled by the appetites of our body, and we can discover our deeper cravings from God. And I'd encourage you to consider fasting from at least one meal in the coming week. And when you fast from that one meal, take the time you would have spent preparing and eating and cleaning up after your meal Take that time to talk with God so you can combine silence and fasting. Do two things in the same time period. And talk with God about the app your appetite for the Spirit's presence in your life. To increase your hunger for the Spirit's presence in your life. And many of us really need to think about fasting even more from technology than we do from food. Because it's such an addiction. Fifth and final thing for your godliness training program is learn from every match. Learn from every game. What do football teams do on Monday? Look at the film. You know? And in our own lives, this can translate to the discipline of journaling. 
And in journaling, we learn to keep a record of our encounters with God so that we can become more like Jesus, so we can grow in godliness. If we never reflect on how we are living, if we never reflect on how we're seeing God at work or sensing God's absence in our life, how do we learn? How do we grow? How do we change? So start a notebook or a journal if you don't have one and just try briefly writing a little bit at the end of the day or the first thing the next day. Look back on the day before. When were you aware of God's presence in your day? When did you feel and joy? When, where did you feel failure or weakness or temptation or fear or anger? And write about it. Get it out. Try to see if God would have you respond differently if the same situation were to arise. All of these spiritual exercises help us train ourselves in godliness. Physical exercise, really important component of healthy living. Growing in godliness, though, is valuable in every way, both in the present life and in the life to come. Former heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali, who died earlier this year, said, I hated every minute of training. Some of us may be able to relate to that. I hated every minute of training, but I said, don't quit. Suffer now and live the rest of your life as a champion. God wants us to live as champions in the kingdom of God. But that means we need to be training for reigning. What are you prepared to do? to grow in godliness. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you challenge us as a good coach does to be more, to do more, to be better than we are on our own. And indeed, while we can do a great deal to influence our own physical health and training, God, we can't grow in godliness without your grace, without your word, without your spirit. So God, we pray that you would motivate us and inspire us today to be able to look to the example of Jesus, that we would want to train to reign in the kingdom of God with you and with him for all eternity. We ask this in his name. Amen.